Hey, we're Phil and Meredith, and we're the pastors here at Cornerstone Church. We're excited to be coming to you through this platform today. We hope that your heart is encouraged, that your faith is stirred by what God speaks to you today. God bless you. Enjoy the message. If you were here on, um, not, it's not Blurred Vision Sunday, and it's not Division Sunday, it's Double Vision and uh, if you were here, if, thank you, Ed. If you were here on um, New Year's, um, then you heard me talk about 2020, which is double. Somebody say double. double. And it's going to be double today. I'm going to preach for a little bit. And then Meredith is going to preach for a little bit. And we're going to have double, double today. Y'all pray that she gets the mic. We're so glad so very excited so very happy today for all of you being here in the house of god you could be anywhere today and some have had to um to push a little harder than others to be here in the house of the lord i met a i met a couple here in the at our mommy location this morning that was their first time here and they're in town from richmond virginia and so i got a chance to meet them and and to see uh new people that are coming from everywhere at all times what a beautiful opportunity and privilege and blessing that we have uh, to be together i'm going to read um, a verse of scripture and um and push off from there and i believe god that something big is getting ready to happen to you all right so let's uh let's let's find ourselves here in the book of joshua chapter 4 you remember this is after Moses and then Joshua comes and they cross over the Jordan and God tells him to pick up um, stones out of the Jordan Joshua chapter 4 and verse number 19 and the people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month you got five days to get there and the people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal in the east border of Jericho and those twelve stones which they took out of the Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal and he spake unto the children of Israel saying when your children shall ask their fathers in the times to come saying what do these stones mean Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan from before you until you passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea. Notice one one generation has a Red Sea experience, and another generation has a Jordan experience. It's double, the same thing at a different season until we were gone over that all the people of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord that is mighty and that you might fear the Lord your God forever forever what a beautiful thing to talk about how we got here and where we go from here I want you to just find three people wherever you're at find three people touch somebody real quick and say tag you're it tag you're it tag you're it Thank you. God bless you. One of the things that's very important for all of us to, uh, to rehearse, to rehearse, is uh, the blessings that God has used and is using to bring us to the place that we are. And uh, most of you that are, that are more than one generation into the things of God know that sometimes stories have to be retold because if you weren't one of those that came out of Egypt then you don't always know how you got here we were thinking over christmas time when we were uh together and then um with uh, theo in our midst that is five generations of believers that we have in the pitts family that are alive today my grandmother is alive and she is a believer my father is alive and a believer and then me and then meredith and phil and theo and uh, th- that's, a, that's a lot. And sometimes when God moves you from one place to another, for there to, to remain the appreciation of what God does, you have to talk about how we got here. 
how we got here. Uh, because uh, it's, it's so interesting that, um, that, that, that Joshua understood this. And as, as they were coming through the Jordan, he was also dealing with a generation of people that had never known Egypt. They had not known Egypt. All they knew was the wilderness. So they had never been where they were, and they had never been into the promised land where they were going. And when they came through that Jordan, God told him, he said, I want every, for every tribe, I want you to pick up a stone a big, you know, like a boulder, and I want you to carry it with you, and I want you to set up a memorial, because sooner or later, your kids are going to say, what's all them stones about? And when they ask you that question, I want you to tell them, the God that brought us out is the same God that took us in. Push on somebody, say, tag, you're it. So, to me, focus, uh, focus is the key of vision. Vision has a lot to do with focus. Vision has a lot to do with focus. Focus is important for seasons because every season has a particular assignment. And if you don't know what your assignment is, you get focused on the wrong thing. When you get focused on the wrong thing, it affects your vision. It affects your vision. So I, I like to talk about focus. And so I say to you that, that the focus of infancy is survival. The focus of childhood is learning. The focus of adolescence is self. And the focus of maturity is reproduction. You have to know how to focus on each one of those things. And I, I'm taking those particular things today just to tell you a little bit because you may be uh, newer than, than some. You may be newer than some to know how we got here. How we got here. Uh, some, sometimes people ask me, where did the name Cornerstone come from? And when Kathy and I uh, started dating 18, 19 years old, we started dating, and, and then we knew after we got married that God had called us to um, start a church. We knew it was in us. We had a church in us. Yeah, all the ladies know what that's like. When you're pregnant with something, it's in you, it's, 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 and it's growing, and we knew that. And so we, we set out uh, and began to pray and ask God, where do you want us to be? And Kathy's family had, uh, had had a ministry in uh, Denver, Colorado, or right in the, in the Colorado uh, area, and uh, it was, it was uh, what most of us would call a halfway house kind of a thing. It was getting uh, hippies and people that were bound by drugs off the streets and putting them into what they called the sunshine home. And that's what Kathy's childhood was spent in. And she loved the mountains and the, and the elevation and the city. And so when she's praying, she's praying, God, send us to Denver, Colorado. I always had a heart for people by the water. And I felt like, you know, the people battling the sun and the sand and the waves, somebody has to reach those surfers for Jesus. Lord, here am I. Send me. Ah, and in our time of prayer, it came to us that we were to start a church in Toledo, Ohio. And so we, the way that we are is when God gives us something, we just we accept that what, what wasn't what we was going to choose, but that's, that's where he said, go, go, go. And, and, and there was a lot of promises that, that, that come with, with uh, obeying God that way. And, but we didn't know what to name the church. I didn't want to name it, you know, something that people didn't know it was a church. I didn't want it to sound like a health club. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to do like, you know, some groups of people, I don't have any rocks to throw, but some groups of people name it after a person, you know, there's like... St. Andrew or St. Bernard. I mean, it's every kind of saint you can think of. And then other groups name them after mountains, Mount Sinai and Mount Moriah and Mount Zion and Mount Everest. And uh, I was going to name it St. Michael's, but I didn't, but that wouldn't work. That, was, that wouldn't work because I'm not a saint, so I, I, I couldn't get by with that. But we wanted a name that everybody could use, whether, whether you were a saint or an ain't whether you were coming or whether you were raised Methodist or Baptist, something we could, that everybody could get around. That's what I wanted to do. And so we were in a meeting, and I would do a little bit of preaching, and Kathy would do a little bit of singing in those days. And, um, and we were in a, in, in, a, in a service, and Kathy got up and sang a song that said, Jesus is the cornerstone, came for sinners to atone. Forever let this truth be known. He remains the cornerstone. I said, I got it right there. And so that's what we, that's what we landed on, and that's how, that's how we received the name of our church. Somebody say, Jesus is, Jesus is 
the cornerstone. I, I want to take those, those, those little elements that I, that I told you about focus so that you know how we got here. The focus of infancy is survival. When we started our church, we were in survival mode. That's what we focused on. We didn't focus on, we didn't focus on missions. We were the mission. We didn't focus on helping the Salvation Army. They gave us the chairs to start our building. We were, we were in the storefront building, and uh, we, were, we were very small. Everything, I'm talking about everything, was survival. I am forever grateful to those who came to our storefront building, and I beg your apology for not knowing what to do. <laughs> but we were in survival mode. I always think like they, they put up with a, with a, a 21-year-old pastor who, who was called to preach but didn't know really what he was doing. I didn't know what I was doing, but, I would, but, but we were in survival mode. Every week was about surviving to the next week. You don't understand what I'm talking about. We had a little PV sound system. Anybody know about a little PV sound system? And everything, everything that, that was under our authority came on with one switch. Don't nobody's church have a lock um, like, a, like a house. You understand what I'm talking about? Like, like you could get into everything we own, like with a house key. Come up to that storefront, turn that little house key, opens up the door, reach around the corner, flip a switch, boom, everything we own came on. <laughs> everything. Everything we own came on. We had a little PV sound system. And those of you that know that our, that our storefront building was on Central and Douglas, and so we're right there at the intersection on Central and Douglas. And, um, and sometimes when, uh, when truck drivers would go past or get stopped at the stoplight and they would start talking on their CB radio, it would bleed into our channel and come out over our system. Sometimes louder than me. And I remember one, one time, I, it was, it's almost like a movie. I remember one time I preached the message and got us to a moment. I'm getting ready to make an altar call. Anybody that wants to be, to, to know Jesus, everybody please bow your head, close your eyes, and let's be serious for a minute. And, it, and it, some truck driver was cussing somebody <laughs> all the way up and down. And because everybody's heads were bowed and eyes were closed, I think some of them thought it was me, but it wasn't me. I promise you before God, it wasn't me. And we just got on through it. We had our first miracle service in our storefront building. And when we were in the storefront building, it just had little, little fluorescent lights up there. And just as I'm getting ready to pray for people, one of the, uh, the ballasts broke. And it started filling the room up with smoke. And somebody jumped up and screamed. And I'm, get, I'm trying to have a miracle service. Somebody jumps up and screams. And they, and they said, there's a fire upstairs. I said, we don't have an upstairs. We ain't got no stairs. And everything was survival, week by week. But when you focus on we're going to make it, when you focus on God is able, when you focus on how God can get you through, it, it does not matter how you start. It just matters that you made it through. Everybody that's a survivor ought to say something. You survived something. You made it. Now, our, our second building reminds me of the, uh, of the focus of childhood, which, which was learning. After, after we got to the place and we, we, were, we were there and filled that little storefront up a couple times, and then so we moved into our next building on, um, on Burn and Hill um, uh, over there in the plaza. And, um, and we, we got in there and we started learning. We started learning. But we already had, see, we already had survival in us. We knew at some, at some level we are going to make it, but, but, we, but we had to learn some things. And, and we had to kind of get it together. I walk, and by the time it was over, we ended up with three different places in that plaza. And I remember going there one time uh, in, in, in the winter, and it got so cold, as it does in Ohio, and um, that, the, that some, you know, water had gotten up underneath the, the cement or however it does, and because it was expanding, it actually pushed the cement up about that far so you couldn't get into the building. And so I went there early on Sunday morning. There's just a few people standing out there. And I pulled on that door, and it kept hitting that concrete. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. We're survivors. S -s -s Somebody around here got to have a hammer. 
got to have something. And so I went out there and broke up the cement so we could open the door because I figured we can fix the cement later, but I can't have church outside when it's 20 below zero. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, so that was our learning time. And I remember, I remember being, um, coming to the place where we were really seeking God on what to do. And sometimes when you don't know what to do, you do what you've seen somebody else do. And so, you know, we had, we had a, a, a church, I don't know, three, 400 people. And, and so, but we had elders and deacons and, you know, we, we were, because we were trying to put together some kind of a structure and that's what we had seen all the churches do. And so that's what we did. And, and I didn't have, I was a, a young pastor still, of course. And then, and then, you know, I didn't know that sometimes people will set up camp on something and try to put their thing into what you're doing. And then some people will, will become territorial and want to hold on to something. And then some people thought that they were supposed to be telling me what to do and all that kind of stuff. And we just kind of, but we were just kind of wrestling around with it. So me being, you know, the timid person that I am, <laughs> I went in on a Sunday morning and I said, I have an announcement to make that there are no positions in this church after today, except for mine. And, um, and I told him, I said, it's nobody's fault. I'm the one that did it. I said, here's, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Some of you will remember these, these days. I said, let's get into the Word of God and find out what He wants us to know. And at the end of it, we're going to figure out who we are. And we did, that, we did that nearly for a year. But that was our focus. That was our focus because we were in childhood. We already proved we could survive. But now we were in childhood and we had to learn. What does this mean? What does that mean? What does this mean? Then, then our, our next move was to Airport Highway. And on Airport Highway, we went into adolescence. And that focus is on self. Who are we? Why has God put us here? And, and so we began to focus on, our, uh, uh, focus on what God had given us to do. What was our assignments in this territory? It takes more than one church to affect the territory. It takes more than one church to affect the community. Every church can't do everything. You got to figure out what God gave you to do and celebrate what everybody else is doing. Because nobody has it all together, but together we have it all. And so, and so we just started trying to find out and pushing in on, on, those, on those directions. And some of you may or may not know that at that time we went on daily television. First church and really only church, I guess, in the history of Toledo, we were on five days a week on secular television. Five days a week on Fox television. At the same time, we had, uh, we had uh, a high-rated uh, Sunday night uh, program on BET television. And we, we were almost always on secular television, and I'm proud to say never raised one offering on television. Not one time did we ever ask anybody because we were preaching to non-believers, and this church and the faithfulness of this house took care of all of it. And I want to say hallelujah and thank God for that. Thank God for the internet because it don't cost like TV cost it. All right. Anyway, so, uh, so, but that's what we were doing in those days. That was the focus of what we did. And then when we came here, that was our next step. We became mature. God required more of us. And now maturity then required of us reproduction. I remember Dr. Sumrall was set to do the um, dedication of this, of this particular building when he passed. And when we were working on this particular building, uh, he came in and walked through it with me. There was no carpet. There was no, no uh, accoutrement. It was, just, it was just wood and ply, plywood and, and drywall. And he was walking through here. And um, I thought we were really hitting it. I thought we were really hitting it, you know, because it was the biggest thing that, that we had ever done. And he, he said to me, as he, he would be very direct, he said, I want you to get a pencil and a piece of paper. So I sit down, and he says, number one, when you get into that building, amateur hour is over. Ooh. Hallelujah. <laughs> I, thought I, was, I thought I was doing good, but I just wrote it down. I just wrote amateur hour is over. He gave me a list of about five things. So when I got back, I got, the, our, I got our team together because this is how I knew how to do it. I didn't know exactly what he meant because I had never been there. And so I said, uh, everybody get out a pencil and a piece of paper. I said, number one, amateur hour is over. Everybody's writing it down. We're all looking at each other, you know. God began to show us that it was time that when he entrusts something to you, that he expects you to come 
up out of childhood, up out of adolescence, and, and begin to reproduce and begin to show and begin to help and aid others in what they're doing. And so from that time, then, then now we have, of course, we have the Eastwood Theater, we have the downtown campus, we have our Lima campus, which is my hometown, we have our Wayne campus, all of those took time. Time, especially at Lima and, and Wayne, took a lot of time and a lot of meetings for me to get built up and plant churches in those areas. Once I began to accept the fact that part of my anointing was that of a fathering anointing, which has certain ramifications to it because it has to do with reproduction, then we began the Cornerstone Global Network, and um, I, I saw Andrew Pena, whose dad helps with all of our uh, Cornerstone Central America churches, and when I first went to Mexico, Andrew, who is now on staff here, was um, six years old, and, um, and now we have 70 churches throughout Cornerstone churches throughout Mexico, Bogota, Argentina. I first went to, yeah. And, um, and so then we, in uh, first time going to South Africa was in uh, uh, the year 2000, 20 years ago. And now we have people pastoring a Cornerstone church that were affected by the meetings that were done in the year 2000. That becomes part of what you do. Somebody shout harvest. I got five minutes, Meredith, and then you're up. Start stretching. <laughs> and, uh, and so, because, because everything in our heart has always been and will always remain the harvest of God. This is a generation that will see a global harvest of salvation come to planet Earth like no other generation has seen. I want to know if there's any faith in this house. You may not hear about it on the news. You may not hear people talking about it. But I'm telling you that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord is going to cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. And we are seeing people all, all over the world being touched by, by all of those things. Always harvest. Watch this now. Harvest, before you can have a harvest, you got, you got to pick soil. You got to pick soil. And we know where God put us. And so once God put us there, we decided that that soil wasn't big enough for us and the devil. And that God had called us for dominion. And one of us got to go. You got to have some soil. You got to have a ground. You have to have a ground. Then you have to be willing to plow. You have to be willing to break up the fallow ground. You understand? And we spend a lot of time plowing, plowing, teaching things and unteaching things and pushing people and what was acceptable for, for a congregation of praise that we weren't going to come to church and sit there and be quiet that we were going to have signs and wonders and miracles that we were going to break down walls of racism and division that we were going to gather God's people together and we just plowed and we plowed and I preached till I made happy people upset I preached till I made tired people upset I preached till I made black people upset I preached till I made white people upset I preached till I made his Hispanic people upset I preach because we got to come together at some point and know that you can't get a harvest unless you're willing to plow you got to plow I'm just trying to tell you how we got here I'm trying to tell you how we got here because it didn't come easy. It didn't come without tears. It didn't come without sweat. It didn't come. So those of you that have been, been here for uh, many years, remember that some of, the, some of the things I'm talking to you about, I'm talking to you about because they came about during tense days. And we still have tense days. But, but, but I, I remember being on, uh, on our local television and Louis Farrakhan was coming to do whatever he was going to do in, in the city. And I got up to preach on a Sunday, and all his guys lined up in the back of the building like they was going to stare me down. I ain't big as nothing, but look. I ain't scared of you, you know. And, and there was tense times, but you had to stand up and preach. I preached till they left. I preached till some of y'all left. But I preached it anyway, because at some point, if a, if a generation or the people of God are going to be who they are, they have to know how to plow. You have to know how to push through something. 
You have to know how to get into something by the Holy Ghost. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. And, and so then you have to be able to sow seed. And then you have to be able to water that seed. And then it takes workers. Jesus said that nothing wrong with the harvest. The laborers are few. And I'm proud to stand here and say that we have some 500 or so volunteers throughout our Cornerstone Church that serve God, our Cornerstone crew, we like to call them. Everybody's part of the Cornerstone crew, say hallelujah. hallelujah. All right, last, last verse. Last verse. I say this because one of the things that we have to understand in the body of Christ is that if there's a focus for every generation and every season, really, there's an assignment for every season. And it, 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 it's, it's one of the hardest things that people don't understand in the body of Christ is we always trying to get plowers to be waterers and trying to get waterers to be plowers. And we're always trying to get someone to fulfill a different assignment. And we are, we are in double vision right here because Kathy and I know what God has given us to do. And... And so some years ago when we started talking with, with Phil and Meredith about leading our one church, five locations into the future, doesn't mean that I'm not the bishop of Cornerstone Churches. Doesn't mean that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to go anywhere. I keep trying to say it to you so that y'all understand. Y'all ain't getting rid of me. You, are you kidding me? It, as long as I walk with y'all through all that mess, no, I'm going to stick around for the harvest. I'm sticking around for the harvest. And... Um, but I do know that there is a need in the body of Christ for those that have been doing it. Kathy and I have been doing it for 35 years, and we're still young enough to say we ain't no ways tired. And you cannot believe, please believe me when I tell you, you cannot believe that the, that the church that you're sitting in right now, whatever location you may be in, is few and far between. There are not churches like this everywhere. And it didn't just fall out of heaven. It took a whole lot to get here, and it takes a whole lot to keep it going, and it's going to take something to get it into the future. And, be, and because it's like that, then I've been able to spend time and increasingly spending time and energy dealing with churches and pastors and trying to help in the season of multiplication, in the season of harvest, in the season of maturity, which is reproduction, to make sure that our churches are all taken care of and doing what God has given me to do. And so I'm, I'm going to read this scripture to you because we have, we have a problem in today's society because we don't understand the New Testament. In the New Testament, you don't have pastors starting churches. That's not their assignment. You have apostles starting churches. And then they put pastors into the churches. And the pastors continue in the apostles' doctrine. So they had this little situation going on in, in Corinth. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm, I'm done with my part. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. For one says, I am of Paul. And another says, I am of Apollos. Are you not carnal? Some translation says, do you not walk like regular people? Who then is Paul? And who then is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. Watch me. I have planted. Apollos watered. But God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth anything. But in other words, the one that is planting is not the focus. The one who is watering is not the focus. God is the focus. And I like this last verse I'm reading to you because here's by the way. By the way, now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. Kathy and I are doing what God gave us to do and working on it, have been for a few years, and we're going we're gonna to keep on walking it out and working it out, but God has also 
put a call upon Phil and Meredith to be watering whatever we have planted and taking Cornerstone Church into the future. And we're going to be given oversight and we're going to give counsel whether they like it or not. They, we're going to give counsel and advice. We're going to be sitting here clapping and cheering and bringing back good reports from all of our churches. But just so that you know, just so that you know, those that plant and those that water are one. It's a 20 over here and it's a 20 over there. The same thing at a different season. God bless you. Come on, Meredith. There you go. Come on, at all of our locations, before we do anything else, I want you to stand to your feet. I want you to honor the gift of leadership that God has given us. And Bishop Pitts and Pastor Kathy, for 33, nearly 34 years, they have been leading this house, growing this house, extending it. We are a people of honor, and we want to celebrate what God has done in our midst. Amen. Well, before you sit down, tap somebody next to you and say, Tag, you're it. All right, church. He did pretty good. I'm pretty impressed. I'm going to move fast and focus. So if you'll stay leaned in with me, one of the greatest challenges of filling my season right now is that you step in at the place of maturity. You just heard the places and the seasons that we've walked through, but we are stepping into a church that is at maturity, and it feels odd sometimes. It feels overwhelming sometimes to look at all of that and say, God, do more. God, we're asking for double. One of the first things Phil and I were ever asked to lead together was a young adults ministry here at Cornerstone Church, and we called it 2.10 out of 2 Kings 2.10, where Elisha says to Elijah, give me a double portion. And it's so interesting how God orders and aligns your steps because we had no idea where he was taking us. And at the time, you know, when you're earlier in your life, when you're younger in your life, sometimes there's an audacity that you don't even realize what you're saying. We were so excited. We were like, yes, give us a double portion. And then you grow a little bit and you're like, ooh, a double portion. <laughs> All right, all right. So I just wanna talk about that for a minute. I'm gonna to turn to Matthew 25, which is the parable of the talents. If you're familiar with it, um, I'm just gonna kinda of run through the passage for the sake of our time. But what happens is there's a businessman and he has three people that are under him and he gives to one of them five talents. It's a, it's a portion of money to look after while he's going away. And he gives to another one two talents to look after while he goes away. And he gives to another one one talent to look after while he goes away. And the one who has five, he takes his five and he invests it and he does good with it. And when the business owner comes back, he has 10 to bring to him. Come on, if you had five and then you add five more to it, that's what? It's double. He doubled it. And the next had two and he takes his two and he invests it and he does well with it and he adds another two. He doubled it. And the one who had one, he buried it and he hid it. And he, and he came back and he said, look, I didn't lose anything. I still have the one. He did nothing with the thing that was given to him. And I want to remind us that it is a kingdom principle that whatever God puts in your hand, whatever he invests into your life, it is our kingdom responsibility to double that thing to increase that thing, to grow that thing. And so trust me when I tell you, no one is looking with more anticipation and with more intimidation than Phil and I going, God, you have put something awesome in our hands. You have put something mature in our hands and it's our responsibility to double that thing, to increase the thing that you have invested into our life because it is irresponsible the scripture calls it wicked. The, ma the master, when he comes back to the one that only came back and brought him one, he calls him a wicked and slothful servant. 
in kingdom order to take what you've had and allow fear and intimidation to cause you to hold on to it and say, if I can just keep exactly what I have, exactly how I have it, and be intimidated by what might happen in advance is wicked and is slothful. And so I want you to know, although fear is there sometimes, although intimidation is there sometimes, faith abounds all the more. And we have a vision to see God double what he has started, to see us double over the next decade our best days, that there is double the salvations coming into this house, double the healings coming into this house, double the services coming into this house, double the influence coming into this house, double the budget coming into this house, double the increase coming into this house, double the outreach coming into this house, double the prophetic words coming into this house, double the stretch and the span of our reach coming into this house that we will not leave this decade the way that we have entered it because he has given us a mature and a ready house. And it is our kingdom responsibility to double what God has given us. And we double what he has placed in our hands the way we have always done what we do. Matthew 6.33 says it this way, Seek first the kingdom of God, and all of these things will be added unto you. We don't spend our days chasing after all of these things. We don't spend our days chasing after people. We don't spend our days chasing after facilities. We don't spend our days chasing after opportunities. We spend our days seeking his kingdom. We are a people in passionate pursuit of his presence. In passionate pursuit of his presence. Next week, we are stepping into 21 days of prayer and fasting so that we can passionately pursue the presence of God. Because in the midst of his presence, all of these things can be found. In the midst of his presence, all of these things are added unto us. So we show up in his house. We show up in the places that he opens doors to us. We show up in our fasting and in our prayer and in our worship. Everywhere that his presence can be found, we show up in those places in passionate pursuit of his presence. And a passionate pursuit of his presence will always lead us to a passionate pursuit of people. Because the heart of God has always been after people. He has always been chasing after others. And so as a people in passionate pursuit of his presence, we become a people in passionate pursuit of people. We are passionately chasing after other people. In creation, the first time God said it is very good is when he created people. And when people stepped out of side of his will for them, He pursued them. He came after them. All of scripture is the story of God's passionate pursuit of his people, bringing them back in right relationship. So in the midst of his presence, we pursue others. And we're going to pursue others in two ways. We are going to pursue the relationships that he has given us inside the body of Christ. We are gonna pursue one another. It's not gonna be said of us that anyone carried their burden alone. It's not gonna be said of us that anyone mourned alone. It's not gonna be said of us that anyone rejoiced or celebrated alone because we are in passionate pursuit of one another. And we are gonna pursue the people in the communities that he has placed us in. We are the answers to the communities, to the cities, to the regions that he has placed us in. And we are going to get outside these walls. We are going to be bringers of people. We are going to be bringers into the house. We are going to be answers in the midst of our workplace. We are going to take that presence that we've been pursuing every single place that we go with healing in our hands, with words in our hands. We are going to get actively involved in the lives of the people around us. In February, we are going to lean into this. Our series in February, we are going to talk all about what it means to pursue 
people from the place of pursuing his presence. And I want you to know that we are doing the same thing in new ways. We are doing the same thing in a new season. The old things that we have always been built on are the things that we are still built on and we are doing them in new ways. We are building on the same bricks that we have always built on. We are building on the unchanging gospel of Jesus Christ, that his sinless life, that his death, his burial, and his resurrection, that he is the cornerstone of our lives, that he is the cornerstone of this church. We are building on righteousness and sanctification. We are building on prayer and evangelism. We are building on the power of the Holy Spirit to step into a situation, to speak into people's hearts and minds and lives, to bring healing, to bring restoration. We are building on the unshakable church of Jesus Christ. We believe in the power of the church that God established it. When Jesus left, he said, establish my church to be the answer to the community, to be the answer to society. And we are leaning in to the unshakable church, to biblical justice, to holiness, to healing, to the scripture and reading of the word. We are devoting ourselves to the apostles teachings that are laid out for us and to the unchanging truths of our faith we are building on the same bricks that we have always built on but we're doing it in a new season and we're doing it in a new way I look at the cameras that are taking this message to our locations right now and to thousands on our online community do you know that our online church gathers more people every single week than we do in our five physical locations at the same time? And I think about the years that we spent as groundbreakers on, in television ministry with cameras and with people standing behind those cameras. And I think about a whole new group of people who are standing behind those cameras doing the same thing in a new way. Over the last couple months, Phil and I have spent some time praying over around 450 people through Facebook. We started something that would reach out to people throughout their week and say, how can we pray for you? And then through a program that it offers, we can sit and send audio recording prayers with those people. It has given us the opportunity and the chance to connect with hundreds of people throughout their week. When we can't physically be here together, many of them unable to get out and to come here. We've had the chance to pray with many of you through that. We've had the chance to pray with hundreds of others Others and dozens of people who we have had the chance to connect with and pray with through that avenue have found their way to one of our services and connected with Jesus in a new way. We are building on the unshakable, powerful prayers that we have always built on. The powers that we believe have the, the prayers that we believe have the power to change lives, but we are doing it in new ways. Tap someone next to you and say, tag, you're it. Because before we leave today, I want to talk a little bit quickly about the difference between Moses and Joshua's ministry. See, Moses was a bad dude, right? Moses was, don't step at me or I will cause frogs to be in your dinner all week. Moses turned the water into blood, caused the sky to go black, led the people of Israel who had been enslaved out of their slavery and into freedom. Moses parted waters. He drew water from a rock. He talked to God and food came falling from the sky. This is Moses. Moses is a bad dude. Moses had a specific assignment. And then Joshua comes along, and Joshua's assignment is different than Moses. Joshua is not Moses. Let me make it super clear. Church planters, founding pastors, Bishop Michael and Pastor Kathy Pitts, as you just heard, are some bad <laughs> mamma jammas. They showed up in a city propped up some chairs and said, God, bring your people here. Thousands of lives have been touched through them. They are 
bad somebodies. A whole network of churches has been birthed around the world through their ministry and through their life. They are awesome. Phil and I are not them. But here's the thing. I don't want you to think I feel bad about that or that I feel small about that. My assignment is different. The thing God has called us to is different. We have been called to a different season in the church. I don't think I could have dug up concrete on a 15 degree cold morning. I'd have been like, sorry guys, I'll see you next week. <laughs> right? Like, we have a different season. We have a different assignment. Joshua knew that he had a different assignment and a different season than Moses. And there's so much that I could say about that, but I want to look at one example. If you'll look at Exodus 14, starting in 21 to 22, this is not long after Moses has led the people out of Egypt. They've left Egypt, and now Pharaoh has changed his mind, and Pharaoh and his armies are coming after them. And here's the problem is that the Red Sea is in front of them. They need to continue escaping Pharaoh and his armies, but there is a sea standing in their way. So they, the people do what they always do. They go to Moses and they start complaining. Couldn't we have just, I think they say, weren't there graves for us in Egypt? That's what they said. Couldn't we have just died in Egypt? Why come out here? I'm like, I mean, at least you got to taste freedom. Like if you're gonna go, go free, right? Anyway, this is my quarrel with the people of Israel. So God, so Moses goes and he talks to God and God says to Moses, stand up and stretch out your staff across the ocean. And so it says, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground and the waters being a wall of them to their right and to their left. And the people walked through on dry ground after God opened the seas through the ministry of Moses. And I want to remind you that the people of Israel under Joshua also found themselves at a water's edge because God's doing the same things at a different time in new seasons. But there's something different about when he calls to Joshua. If you turn to Joshua 3 with me, Starting in verse nine. It's so interesting how God orders and walks your paths. For most of my adult life, I found myself drawn to the book of Joshua, to the story of Joshua. I loved all of the stories and the things that Joshua would pick up. I loved all the contrasts. I could probably preach and talk to you for a year about all of the contrasts between Joshua's ministry and Moses' ministry. And I didn't know why until about 18 months ago. <laughs> I thought, oh, I see what you've been doing, Lord. But in Joshua 3, the children of Israel find themselves on the edge of the Jordan, and God is speaking to Joshua about how he's gonna part the waters this time. And Joshua said to the Israelites, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. See the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, the presence of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from among the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and will stand up in a heap. So under Moses, Moses stood up in front of the people, cast his staff over the waters, and the waters parted, and they walked on dry land. Under Joshua, it takes 12 other people to get underneath the weight of something and then walk into the midst of something, and then the waters will be parted. So God parts the waters in both situations, but he does it in different ways. And he does it in different ways because Moses' assignment and Joshua's assignment were different. 
See, under Moses, Moses had to teach them what it meant to be a people. Moses had to teach them what it meant to walk into freedom. Under Moses, the people have lived all of their lives for generations in slavery. They have mentalities that have to be broken. They have mindsets that have to be changed. Moses has to show them, your God is powerful. Your God is able. Moses has to show them, this is what it looks like to believe in God and to walk with God and to follow God and to do the things that God. Moses has to show them, this is what a happy church looks like. This is what a diverse church looks like. This is what a power church looks like because I've seen what God has spoken to me, but you haven't seen it yet. So look and see. When Joshua comes in, he steps in to a people of maturity and he says, oh, you know what this looks like. You know that God can part the waters. You know that he has ordered us. You know that we do things decently and in order. You know that, that we attack our lack in this place and that we believe that God has called us into prosperity. You know that we believe in participatory church where we lean into the praise and the worship, that we're not a show, but that we've come. You already know that because you are a mature house. And so because you're a mature house, I can't stand up and do it for you. In this season, the new way that God is doing it is that I need some people who are vision carriers to come up under the vision and start carrying out this thing. Because if we're gonna have a double portion vision, if we're gonna have a double portion anointing in this decade, we're gonna have to have a double portion capacity people. A double portion capacity for what God is sending us. We can't carry double on our old ways. We have to carry double on new ways. So what we're looking for is a double portion people who are willing to carry the weight of some things. A double portion group of volunteers who say we're going after double. So it's time for me to get signed up. It's time for me to get involved. A double portion prayer partner group. We're looking for a double portion tithers who say, it is my responsibility to establish what God is doing in this season. It is my responsibility to fund the vision that God is speaking into our community. We're looking for double portion worshipers. We're looking for double portion givers. We're looking for double portion prayers, for double portion volunteers, for double portion people to stand behind cameras and to minister to kids and to sing out. And on our production teams, we need a double portion capacity people because I'm not Moses I'm not gonna stand up and part the waters I need us to get alongside and carry the weight of what God is saying in this season and I believe that if we will work together we will see a double portion a double portion of the best days that we have ever seen. A double portion in every aspect of what God has called us to. That we are stepping into our season of double. Why don't you stand with me at all locations? When God calls us into maturity, he calls us into reproduction. He calls us into a time of saying, I'm part of what's happening. I have responsibility here. Maturity is about reproduction and responsibility. When I'm a child, I say, no one brought me anything. No one laid out clothes for me. No one gave me food. When I'm an adult, when I'm grown, when I'm mature, I say, I have responsibility in this. And right now, the weights are unbalanced. We have had 30 some years of putting stones in one side where a generation has built up and said, look at all that God has done. And it's time for a generation, a double portion capacity generation to start putting our stones in a new side because we need both of these sides for our weights to be balanced. We need weight in both of these sides. And I don't want to leave you thinking that it's not happening. 
This last week, I was talking to one of our 12-year-olds. Her name is Gracie, and she has brought 10 different people with her to church this year. She is a bringer of people. I think so many of us should take the challenge to meet her where she is and be capacity bringers into the house. During our New Year's Eve offering, one of our 17-year-olds did a barrier-breaking offering and gave a $500 offering as part of our New Year's Eve offering. I don't know what you were doing when you were 17, but I would guess many of us were not taking $500 and investing it into the kingdom of God. They are putting stones on the side. They are equaling out, balancing out the scale. Next week, you're gonna hear the story of a young family that has gotten involved with what God is doing here. But it's gonna take all of us carrying the vision, seeing a double portion of what God can do in our midst. Amen? God, we thank you for all that you have done. We thank you for the incredible privilege and honor to step into your presence. Make us pursuers of your presence, pursuers of people, and give us a double portion capacity. God, I thank you for every stone of remembrance. And I, I thank you, God, that you're giving us new stones of remembrance. Teach us how to do the same thing in new ways for a new season, God. And we will run after it with all that we have. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. I hope that message meant something to you and that it means something in your days to come. Yeah, if this message has blessed you and you wanna sow into the ministry of Cornerstone Church, you can do so from wherever you are today. Simply jump on our website at cornerstone.church and you can find the link there so that you can give in whatever way is most convenient to you. And we'll see you back here next time.